Alright, so we begin now with fundamental analysis. In my textbook, it is chapter 11. Chapter is called Macroeconomic and Industry Analysis. So, what we will focus is on so called macro analysis uh, for this and probably uh, the next uh, lecture. Now, let's begin with a little bit of a background what or how this course started out. We started out with uh, the following uh, five analysis. We have a portfolio analysis. The next type of investment analysis keeps on, right? The next type of analysis is fundamental. Fundamental. The third type is technical. The fourth one is behavioral. And the last type of analysis is cyclical. So what we did so far for about roughly maybe what five, four weeks, we did for four weeks roughly uh, portfolio. We also had the intro section. The intro took roughly about two weeks. So portfolio analysis roughly about four weeks. On fundamentals I will spend approximately three weeks and on technical, behavioral and cyclical roughly four, one and one weeks to explain each of these. So right now here we are on fundamental analysis. So fundamental analysis begins with analyzing the fundamentals. So we have to clarify what fundamentals mean. Fundamentals refer to the ability of an asset to generate income, to generate profit or to generate Return. So the fundamental is associated with the income. For a stock, it will be associated with the dividend. Is the stock profitable? And if it's profitable, does it generate cash? And is it able to distribute dividend? So dividends and if for a stock, earnings will be important in terms of fundamentals. For a bond, fundamentals mean, again, ability to service debt. Uh, risk will be associated with default. Are they able to service debt or there is a risk that they might not be able to pay back all in full. For real estate, fundamentals are associated basically with rent. That's it. Is it good rent? Is it bad rent? Is it going to be able rent to increase or is it going to be decreased? Is rent at high risk or at low risk? You may have a, a corporate office, but if you can't fill it up with corporate tenants, it's, you know, the rent is relatively high risk. Also, you may have a corporate office and if more and more corporations are eager to move in that area, like in Riyadh, it will be Olea, right? So everyone wants to move to Olea on either side of King Fahd Road. In this particular case, this will be, uh, real estate will be very good fundamentals because more and more and more businesses are willing to move in that area and potentially pay a higher rent. Now, the fundamentals for a currency are a little bit different. The one fundamental is interest rate. Is the interest rate high or is the interest rate low? High interest rates usually indicate relatively strong fundamentals. The other fundamental for a currency is whether the government is debasing the currency or not. Whether government prints money and increases the money supply too much and too fast, the answer is usually that the fundamentals of the currency are 
with too much printing money results in debasing of the currency and results in a falling value of the currency. Falling value of the currency, we call it weak or poor fundamentals. Governments not printing money usually result in strong fundamentals. All right, so this is what fundamentals uh, essentially mean. Question? Fundamentals is ability to generate income and first and foremost ability to hold its value and generate income. Now, based on fundamental analysis, you have the next most important concept is that of valuation. Valuation means the ability to use investment analysis, in this particular case, fundamental analysis, to assign a value to an asset. The textbook usually talks about security, as in stocks and bonds, but we use valuation to assign value to gold, to oil, to wheat, in other words, to commodities and also to assign value to currencies. So, valuation is the process of using mostly income information, in other words, fundamental analysis, to assign values. Uh, from this respect, valuation has been considered the most important branch in finance. From this perspective, therefore, uh, fundamental analysis has been considered to be the most important type of analysis in finance. For many decades, maybe even for centuries, fundamental analysis has been considered the one, the big one, the primary, the only type of analysis. But as I have come to explain, uh, it is one thing to provide good analysis, it is a completely different thing to invest successfully and invest profitably and hopefully to invest better than other investors and hopefully to beat the market. These are two different things. A lot of times good fundamental analysis is not enough to provide good investment returns. Alright, is that clear? Alright, the next concept is something which I covered some time ago uh, to repeat is that usually, usually but not always, the approach, fundamental approach is known as top-down approach. Top-down approach simply means that you begin analyzing first the global economy and the overall global environment and the overall potential of a particular country or particular asset class within the global environment. Once you have analyzed or evaluated the global environment, then you move to the macro economy. Macro economy. So, you first see, is the world booming or is the world in a recession? Right now, April 4, uh, 13, 2009, the economy, the global economy is suffering through a recession possibly a global depression. The global economy is extremely weak, so one has to be extremely careful. So you analyze that part, and then you look into economies, which economies are profoundly weak, and definitely uh, you would want to uh, avoid investing. U.S. economy, terribly weak, probably the most weak economy in the world. British economy, extremely weak. Western European economies, generally weak. In much worse shape are Eastern European economies. They are in deep, deep trouble. 
Uh, which is or in really bad shape right now in Japan. All right. So what might be relatively strong economies? Well, these are those economies that did not the stupid did not do the stupid things that Western economies and Japanese did. Uh, from a strength point of view, maybe one of the strongest economies in the world is still today the Saudi economy. It did not participate in the wild and crazy boom from 2002 to 2007, and it will not suffer as much from the bust. Chinese economy is fundamentally sound. Yes, right now it's weak, but it has had all throughout the last decade solid savings. It has had good, solid investments. It has productive assets, machines, equipment, it produces goods, it produces services. Uh, Taiwanese economy is in pretty good shape. Singaporean economy is in good shape, meaning fundamentally. Right now, they may be going through a recession, but the point is, is the recession, you know, is the economy, macroeconomic fundamentals strong or weak? If the macro fundamentals are strong, the recession will be quick and the country will be faster to recover. If the fundamentals are weak, as in Great Britain and the US, then it means that the recession will be long, the recovery will be weak, overall earnings for stocks will be relatively poor, and overall investment results will be also weak. The third part in a, uh, a top-down fundamental approach is to analyze the industry. Uh, United States uh, service economy. If you are a massage therapist, I'd say pretty bad industry to be in right now. <laughs> right now, a decent industry will be possibly education, food and energy. So, in other words, right now you want to be in what is called a defensive industry. Defensive industry we define as industry which is not hurt a lot when the overall economy is hurting. Food will be one example. No matter how terrible the economy is, people will not cut down on food. Now, they will cut down on expensive restaurants, and restaurants are hurting big time, and a lot of restaurants and restaurant chains are closing down. But when it comes to basic food, potato, rice, and whatnot, people will keep eating because they need it to survive. Other defensive stuff will be generally all necessities. Electricity, Walmart. Walmart, well, Walmart has now become a necessity. It's become essential for economic and financial survival of families. So right now they're cutting on the higher end retailers and they're going to Walmart. But electricity is an essential. Gasoline, you still gotta drive to work. You still gotta do whatever you have to do. So these we consider essential. The uh, opposite of defensive is called cyclical. Cyclical industry is an industry which suffers significantly during economic weakness and which grows significantly during an economic recovery, an economic boom. Luxury, all sorts of luxury industries usually are highly cyclical. So, uh, necessities usually are defensive, they fluctuate little. Toothpaste, people will not be saving money on toothpaste. They're going to be spending two or three dollars anyway. No matter how terrible the recession is, most civilized people will continue to brush their teeth, all right? Well, you might, you know, cyclical will be, let's say, luxury or expensive SUVs or uh, BMWs or whatever they consume. They just say, well, the economy is too weak. Let me first, you know, see that the economy recovers. 
In other words, consumer confidence is essential for some industries, which are we call cyclical, and for others, it's not essential. They'll still keep shaving. All right, anyway. So, industry. And the last one is the company level. Company level. You want to analyze separately Walmart from GM. From GE and it comes to look at McDonald's. McDonald's, yes. You have to look at the specifics. Now, what is important to understand, which is usually not well understood or misunderstood, is that just because people keep going to McDonald's does not mean that McDonald's is a good investment. To be a good investment, it requires number one, not just good solid consumers. It requires good management, which results in a good control of costs, and eventually it boils down to earnings. We also call them profits. So, what you need is that the company is profitable, all right? That it provides a good, solid, reliable, long term return on capital, all right? So, just because you have good, just because you have uh, good customers, reliable, doesn't mean that it's a good company to invest in. So, the key when you're looking into a company, number one, let's use blue color, right? Number one is it has got to be profitable. And number two, which we'll spend a significant amount of time not right now is, yes, it may be great customers, it may be highly profitable, but it has to be overvalued. In this case, it should not be overvalued. Not overvalued. Now, let's provide one of the great examples, which Saudis will understand good, is Sabic. Last semester, I had 15 students in investment. They all oh, Sabic is a great investment, really great. So, well, if 15 students, which are 20 year old, tell me it's a great investment, how do you even know it's a great investment? And the answer is, oh, TV says it's a great investment. Newspapers say, all financial advisors, advisors said, well, most likely it is a terrible investment. They said, no, no, no. Savvy is, you know, doing whatever. Oil, for example, it is refining, it is very profitable. He said, yeah, but that's not enough. If you're already paying 50 times earnings, and if your earning yield is barely two percent, it's extremely overvalued. It's already, a, you know, a terrible investment. I can also guarantee you, my watch will serve you perfectly for the next twenty years, but no one's going to pay one billion for the watch. All right. So for the same, for the same idea, if it makes one dollar of earnings, you don't want to pay fifty dollar price. All right. Someone else will. So, you must make sure that it is not, not overvalued. In other words, that it's properly valued or undervalued. Well, let's clarify the connection. The connection is Sorry, sir, there. but by the way, Savic right now, they're not, uh, they're not, I mean... They're Savic, not what? They're not, yeah, they're not doing as well as before because oh, okay. well, they export Actually, they export the goods. Right, and there's no demand. Yeah. Yes, but the point is completely different. The point is not whether they're doing well or not doing well. The point is completely different. Just because the company has good products in strong demand, which are selling well, in which the company has good profits, does not make it yet a good investment. That's the most important part to understand. Just because Walmart is selling well and has good profits does not mean that it's a good investment. What it may mean is that every investor in the world has figured out that Walmart is making good profits. Maybe it's a safe investment, but not... No, no, no. doesn't mean it's a safe investment either. Awesome. Yes. If here is... Here is the next uh, lesson. If it is overvalued, let's put this connection, overvalued. 
If it is now overvalued, it certainly, this is certain, makes it extremely risky. If it's overvalued, it certainly means, of course, it's the exact opposite, not safe. Not safe. Alright? Uh, because we're talking about stocks, the example will be just as good with real estate. 300 million Americans believe that real estate is safe. And the answer is yes. If real estate is undervalued or properly valued, real estate is extremely safe investment, extremely safe, all right? But if it's overvalued, real estate is very, very, very risky. And now, of course, with the real estate bust, Americans are learning the meaning of risk, right? You suffer big losses and, you know, suddenly your whole life is messed up. Well, they're learning the meaning of leverage, but that's a different topic for a different lecture. Alright, so, fundamental analysis, no doubt, is extremely important. Fundamental analysis, no doubt, is probably the most important. But, it is not yet enough for successful investing. All great successful investors in the world also do some technical, also do behavioral, also do all the others. Uh, for example, Warren Buffett is usually hailed as the greatest when it comes to fundamental that he is rock solid into fundamentals. And the answer is no, 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 no. He is not. He is using big time behavioral analysis. Warren Buffett says, and he's been always saying that he buys when everyone is selling and when everyone is fearful and he sells when everyone is buying. Vice versa. Vice versa. So, this is part of contrarian type strategy which is based on behavioral analysis, right? So, I've been always explaining before, and I usually like to repeat it over and over again, is when I had 20 Saudi MBA students telling me that oil is going down, I know that they're all wrong. You cannot have 22-year-old 22, 22 students each getting the oil market right. If they can get the market right, they won't be sitting listening to me. They'll be all millionaires or billionaires by now, all right? In other words, if there is a huge controversy about the market, it's pretty much clear. But when you have amateurs agreeing on the direction of the price, you're sure that they're always wrong. This is the nature markets. Well, when it was that, when they were telling me and trying to convince me, well, that was like four months ago in November uh, or December, when they were telling me, no, 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 the oil market's going down. Well, how do you know? Guess what? They heard it on the news. They heard it on CNBC. They were listening to media and whatnot. Well, back then, the price of oil was $38, $39. And this was the day the oil market bottomed. The day the oil market in 2008 bottomed at 37 or whatever dollars. And on that same day, when 22 students were convinced it's going down, the market went up and up and up and up and never looked back. And the market proved all these 22 students to be wrong. Well, again, this is the type of mentality which uh, or an investment approach that Warren Buffett uses in his investments. You know, he would love, would have loved to know that 22 MBA students agree that the price is going down. When they all think it's going down, that's when Warren Buffett buys. All right. So back to this stuff. Now I have now got to understand that doing fundamental analysis, and especially this little piece here called macro investment analysis. Usually I've done about one 
full semester course on macro investment analysis back in Bulgaria. Uh, number one, I had a savvy guy who sent me an email a while ago asking me straightforward, well, I understand where you did the part of your course which you called economic growth. In other words, if you are going to be doing solid macroeconomic investment analysis, you need to understand economic growth. There is no way around it. You got to understand which country grows healthily and which country grows in a sick manner. In other words, is a phony growth. All right? Can you give us examples right now, sir? The greatest country in the world, America. America's economic growth has been unsound and unhealthy. Chinese growth, uh, Taiwanese, Singaporean growth has been mostly healthy. In other words, healthy growth is based on a number of things. That's where you want to study growth. It's based on good savings, number one on strong investments, on production and productivity resulting from investments. And the last piece is small, non-interventionist government, which allows the economy to work its own way. In other words, we call it economic liberty. In other words, relatively small regulatory environment. In this respect, the best country in the world has been Singapore. Question. What do you think about Qatar, sir? Oh, Qatar has terrific, great fundamentals, one of the best in the world, but they are mostly based on natural gas. Uh, strong, solid fundamentals have Australia, but they're mostly based on excellent natural resources of all kinds. Strong fundamentals are right now in Canada, again, based on strong fundamentals, strong resources availability. In other words, if you have today a country with good natural resources and the ability to produce them, of course, efficiently, right, the country will have great fundamentals. Saudi Arabia, in this respect, is very well endowed. The efficiency of oil extraction is excellent, probably the best in the world. Well, how do we measure it? The cost per barrel of oil. Still, the lowest in the world is in Saudi Arabia. Um, the opposite example of that will be a country very well endowed economically is Iran. But the Iranian production of oil and gas is extremely inefficient, extremely inefficient. The cost is roughly 10 times higher. In other words, it costs them 10 times more to produce out of the ground a barrel of oil in Iran as opposed to a barrel of oil in Saudi Arabia. From this perspective, we call it productivity, in this case for oil, it's 10 times better in Saudi Arabia than in Iran. This means strong productivity allows for strong fundamentals and weak productivity allows for weak fundamentals and it is as simple as that. Russian oil and gas industry is extremely inefficient. From this perspective, of course, this is reflected in a high cost of producing oil and gas. Russian fundamentals are relatively poor. They are better than they ran relatively poor. A country with excellent natural resources is Venezuela. And it's the same story as Iran. Very inefficiently run. Governments uh, very inefficient. You know, all these kind of things. In other words, very bad, call it macroeconomic environment, which certainly results in poor macro fundamentals. Number two, you cannot possibly ever invest successfully and do decent fundamental analysis unless you understand business cycles. Business 
cycles, all right? Business cycles are essential. You have to know when the economy is weakening. You have to see it before other investors see it. You have to know when the economy is recovering. You have to see it before. And in this particular case, over the last two weeks, let's call it March and April of 2009, for example, many, too many investors around the world in the United States believe that the business cycle in the United States is turning up. Within six to nine months, the U.S. economy will be in recovery, the so-called second half recovery. And as a result of that, they have been massively investing in the stock market. Stock market had a huge rally, I might call it bear market rally. And the stock market has gone up 20% in anticipation of economic, good economic recovery in the second half of 2009 or possibly in the first half of 2010. But if they got the recovery wrong, and most of them probably did, this will guarantee them huge losses. This will guarantee that the rally will not hold, and if the market, the, the, sorry, the economy does not recover, earnings will not recover. And if earnings will not recover, there is no way that the market will hold. The market will probably report brand new bear market lows. These guys, it's called in English, will have their head handed on, you know, to them. In other words, they're going to get slaughtered, most likely. So, trying to forecast a recovery and getting it wrong is a recipe for disaster. you got to be extremely sharp at business cycles and you got to get the business cycle right. And if you can't get the business cycle right, you don't stand any chance in investing whatsoever. And then you have the part three, which is the macro investing part. So these are the three key elements to get right the macro investment part. Now, turns out that from a Wall Street perspective, Wall Street will have you believe and the textbook will have you believe that the most important part is company analysis. And this is certainly totally wrong. The most important part for invest, successful investing is getting the macro analysis right. You may get the company right, but if you get the macro picture wrong, you're likely going to be failing in your investments. You may get the industry right, but if the macro economy is a disaster, your investments will likely fail. The opposite, however, is true. You may get the wrong fundamentals of the company, the company is just a bad company, and you may get the wrong industry. And the company might not do well, the industry might not do well, but in a booming, strong, solid, booming economy, where the macro economy is strong, the fundamentals are healthy for the whole economy, you may get excellent stock market performance. In other words, a bad stock can easily perform well with the overall market. If the overall market goes up in a year 30%, a bad stock could likely go 5, 10, 15, even 20% up. All right? Well, let's provide another example. Another example will be, well, historical example will be dot coms and telecoms. You had these dot-com companies, 9 out of 10 were terrible. Now we know that 9 out of 10 did go backwards. But back then, if you got the dot-com telecom idea right, if you got it on the dot-com telecom boom right, you would have made a lot of money with bad companies. While the boom lasted, once the boom is over, you're going to lose a lot of your money. So, trying to figure out the boom is more important than trying to figure out the right company. Now, if you're going to be doing 
very, very long-term investing, you got to do both. You got to figure out the boom rate. You got to figure out the company rate. Then you got to figure out the right entry point, meaning that you buy when it's not overvalued, and then you hang in there. Right? In other words, you buy right and stay tight. That's how it's called. You buy right and stay tight. Because the company may be good, but if you buy overvalued, you may have to wait for 5, 10 or 15 years for the valuations to come, you know, to catch up with the price, and you may underperform easily for 20 years, even though the company was good, but you just bought at the wrong time when the company was clearly overvalued as Savic would appear to me back then by listening to students and without doing fundamental analysis. You know, when they told us, everyone is buying Savic. I said, well, then we know for sure that it's terribly overvalued. It can't be possible that everyone's buying and it's not overvalued. It's impossible. If everyone's buying, it is overvalued, all right? So, you may buy, and the company is great. I mean, the products will always sell, the demand will be always there, and the company is probably very efficient. But this is no reason to pay 50 or 100 times its earnings. In other words, to overpay. All right? And if you overpay, you are not likely going to make a lot of money in the midterm and in the long term. Sure, in the short run, there will be even more bigger fools buying and pay even more over that, all right? But in the long run, it's likely that valuations hold their course. So if it's overvalued within two, three, five, ten years, valuation will come back to sooner or later normal. In other words, valuations cycle around the genuine, and we'll define later what normal means. So the guy said, hey, economic growth, it's clear where you got it, and there are lots of books, business cycles, plenty of books. How and where do you get macro investing? And the answer is there are no books. I had to use a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, a lot of reading, and probably the most important is market history. You have to study a lot of market history to figure this part right. So you got to know the history of the markets and this is the best way to learn the market about the market and to know about the market is to know its history. So it's basically I have made this up over 10 years of teaching, learning, playing with the markets and everything else. This is what I've been working on to figure out. So only for this part or for these three parts it's easy to make a full course, but we'll try to stick with it two or three weeks here. All right, questions so far? No questions. All right, let's see what's next, what's next? All right, so uh, global economy, that's fairly straightforward. Dome domestic economy. Now, on the domestic economy, domestic sometimes we'll call it national economy. I keep calling it, calling it the macro economy. So what is important for the macro economy? Uh, macro economy. What is important? Well, this is nothing more and nothing less than what I gave you on your exam to cover the investment in the macro view of Jim Kuklava. First and foremost, growth, as in economic growth. You have to figure out whether the economy will have a strong growth or a weak growth, a strong recovery or a weak recovery, a shallow recession or a deep recession, a V-shaped recession or a U-recession, or now some people like Corbini talking about the L-shaped recession, all right? So you have to figure out the growth right 
and there is no way around it. Well, this, of course, is the same as part one, economic growth, and number two, business cycles. So the growth part here also figures out not just the growth is economic growth, it figures out as to the business cycle. So here you must figure out the business cycle and there is no way around it. Alright? Number two, inflation. You must figure out inflation right And if you don't, you will suffer the illusion that you're making good money when in reality you're not. American investors, amazing, this is extraordinarily amazing, where a whole nation of investors will think that as Dow Jones bottomed about what, 7,000 to six, seven years ago, and it doubled literally in five or six years after 2007, it was roughly double. They believed they had extraordinary return, like 100%, but these were phenomenal. When you look at the real inflation, how much bread went up, how much gasoline went up, how much houses went up, how much vacations or electricity or anything else went up, prices roughly doubled, roughly. Education, tuition doubled, Healthcare, medical, in other words, whatever people consume a lot and was basically a necessity and people spend money on, it roughly doubled. So, people live under the illusion that they had great returns and they're like the smartest people on the planet Earth by doubling their money in six years, not realizing that the purchasing power of their money fell in half and that their real returns were close to zero or possibly negative. Well, for the same period, gold went up three times much better. Oil went up at that point, how many? Five, oh, six times. So, if you, for the same period, for the same period, uh, oil was early on at $15 and up there in 2007 was close to $70, $80, $100. Oil went up 10 times. 10 times is an infinite, it's better investment than dumping your money, all right? But people don't see this, all right? And we can talk about, you know, the psychology later on of how they're focused on the stock market and don't see that out there there's so much better investments returning so much more. You know, that's typical. All right, so inflation is extremely important because you must, and this is extremely important, you must account for real, real returns. This is the first reason. The second extremely important reason that you must absolutely get inflation right is nominal returns on bonds. If inflation is high and rising, bonds become extremely risky investment. You're sure to get low or negative real returns. So, getting inflation right is extremely important for stocks, is extremely important for bonds. Well, if you're going to be getting very high accelerating inflation, it becomes extremely important for commodities because commodities will be outperforming in a generally accelerating inflationary environment. In a decelerating inflationary environment, they will underperform. So inflation is extraordinarily important for commodities too. All right? And inflation is relatively important for real estate, but not as much, not as much. And I would, real estate will generally float with inflation. Real estate returns will float with, uh, with inflation. And unless you have bubble dynamics or severe recessions, uh, it is not as important for uh, real estate. All right? Next. Unemployment. Unemployment. Extremely. Again, uh, I keep saying extremely important, but they are because they are uh, unemployment.
Of course, if people don't have jobs, they'll be consuming less. Unemployment also affects confidence. We call it consumer confidence. If consumers are confident, they will be spending, and if they will be spending, it will become revenue of corporations, and corporations will translate revenues into profits, and profits will translate eventually into higher stocks. Now, or over the last six months, the big problem of the market was that consumers have lost confidence because unemployment was rapidly rising, so consumers aren't effectively aren't spending. And if they aren't spending, this means that businesses are hurting and many of them are actually going bankrupt and closing down. Next. Productivity. Again? Productivity. Yeah, productivity. Productivity is, again, remarkably important because it is one of the many barometers of the health of the economy. High productivity and rising productivity is indicative of strong, solid, fundamental health of the economy, which will productivity understand. In the end, it always results in higher. So higher profit productivity results in higher uh, profit. In other words, growing productivity results in growing profits and profitability, and this will translate into better returns. So productivity is also very important for this and also for many other reasons. What's next? Government spending. Yeah, government spending. Uh, let's call it in general because I separated it for you in the exam. Fiscal policy. And when we say fiscal policy, we certainly mean two distinct things. Number one is government taxes, and number two is government spending. It takes no degree in no economic study to know that if government is raising taxes either on people or on businesses, this will hurt the economy, this will hurt the incentives, and this is well known and currently no school of economic thought argues that raising government taxes is overall bad for the economy. Government spending is of course the most controversial. Modern schools of economic thought, the common modern Keynesian economics believe that government spending can boost the economy, while well, older classical school and the modern Austrian school believes that government spending is clearly hurting the economy. Yes, government spending provides a short-term relief to the economy, but in the long run it can only hurt the economy. Modern Austrians believe that short-term benefits of the, of the economy today always come at a much, much higher cost of tomorrow. Keynesians believe that, oh, all you need to do is take care of today and tomorrow, if necessary, we'll take care of it again. Alright? They just believe that you can keep pumping the economy and keep the economy pumped and there are no long-term bad consequences. Uh, this is extremely controversial. It is a point of view and it is about understanding how economies work. And this is where economists can keep arguing over and over and over again. It is the philosophy of the economics and I'm not going to get into this course in great detail now. Next. Uh, yeah, we can say monetary policy, but that's part of inflation, yes. Monetary policy affects growth and inflation and unemployment and productivity and 
it affects fiscal policy, although you're told now that they're independent. Well, they're not. Just look at two buddies sitting hugging each other, Bernanke and Guy. All right? One responsible for monetary, the other one for fiscal. Well, you see them on TV all the time, together. They plan together, they work together, they do everything together, right? So, now or in hard times, they're not independent. They become interdependent. Why? Because in bad times, usually most governments in the world, South is actually an exception right now, spends a whole lot more than it takes in revenues. In other words, in bad times, most governments in the world run huge deficits. And fiscal policy running huge deficits desperately needs monetary policy to print the money to finance government spending by printing. We call this Senorage. Senorage is the revenue which the government raises from issuing money. So, right now, the trillion dollar deficits in the United States cannot be financed by any other way because the economy does not have the savings. The rest of the world now in the recession does have the savings. So there is one and one way only to print. And print will result in huge inflation and fiscal policy suddenly turns out to be extremely important for bond investors which will be suffering most likely huge negative returns based on surprisingly high inflation and it will be also important for commodity, gold, oil, wheat, whatever investors and it will be important for real estate. In other words, it turns out that extraordinary amount of government fiscal stimulus must be necessarily, we call it monetized. Monetization is the process where the central bank purchases assets and pays for them with newly issued money. In other words, monetization is the equivalent of printing money. And when we say now that the, the government will, you know, finance itself by printing, we simply say that the government debt will be monetized by the central bank. All right? So the government issues the debt and the central bank prints the money. So we call this debt monetization. All right? So back to fiscal policy and whatnot. All right, well, what's next? So monetary policy is not per se macro. It affects the macro economy. In this case, we're talking about government taxes and government spending. Or if you want to have monetary policy, you can put it in here. Monetary policy inflation. Again, monetary policy is very important, probably the most important when it comes to the business cycle. Very important when it comes to interest rates and everything else. All right, so the next is interest, rate. uh, interest rates. Whether interest rates will be rising or whether interest rates will be falling is extremely important. Now, when you talk about interest rates at all times, you must always be absolutely clear whether you talk about real or whether we talk about number. In a remarkably direct way, this is a mathematical, pure mathematical relationship, interest rates determine directly returns on bonds. So interest rates are directly related on bonds, but interest rates are very important on stock returns because interest rate determines indirectly the discount factor on stocks. So rising interest rates usually are negative for stocks because rising interest rates result in a rising discount factor. So when you have the earnings or the dividend discount formula, as the discount factor rises, the value falls. Well, many people say, but wait a minute. When the economy is growing strong and interest rates rise, uh, stock prices go up, not down. And the answer is yes, when interest rates rise, 
Many times, because the economy is growing and booming, you have the earnings rising or the dividends rising, pulling the stock price up. And you have interest rates rising, pushing the stock down. And in strong boom times, the earnings or the dividend effect will outweigh the interest rate effect. All right? So, stocks could go up during rising interest rates, but in general, the rising interest rates hurt stocks. All right? Let's do one more, which is trade. Deficits. A good, strong, healthy economy runs typically trade surpluses, which means that it exports more than it imports. A relatively unhealthy and weak economy in general will have trade deficits, in other words, they'll be importing more than exporting. So, when a country runs trade deficits, there are four different interpretations, but you should understand two of them. Number one is it's probably running a trade deficit because it's not producing, not yes. producing. If you're not producing it, you will have to import it, all right? Or, if you're not exporting, that's probably because you're not producing much. The perfect example is, no, America. America is not producing and therefore has to import, and at the same time is not producing and it can't export, and Trade deficits in America are a result of not producing in general. Well, there is a completely different reason. They usually interrelated, if you study carefully international finance, is that trade deficits are caused or as a result of low savings. Low savings and low savings. So, trade deficits, one of the interpretations is that the nation is consuming more than it's producing. But if you consume more than you're producing, this is the same as you're not saving enough or you have low savings. Well, when you run a trade deficit, this means that you're importing capital or you're effectively importing savings from abroad. In other words, you're not saving enough, and you're importing the savings from the problem. Well, we call these trade deficits is mathematically and logically equivalent to capital, capital surplus. Surpluses. So, a capital surplus, essentially, the best interpretation is that you import capital from abroad, well, which is the same as importing savings from abroad. Of course, you use the capital surplus to pay for the deficit. Alright? In other words, the best way to think of it is vendor financing. Vendor financing means that China produces it. When it produces it, it sends it to the United States and provides credit for selling it. In other words, when the Americans buy it, they don't pay for it. They borrow to pay for it. And the Chinese lend to Americans for it, to buy it, right? So, essentially trade deficits usually are poor fundamentals on the production side and of course low savings. Well, what is the interpretation of low savings? The interpretation of low savings is that savings are necessary for investment. Necessary. Which certainly means that low savings result in low investments. Alright? Low investments result in low productivity. Low productivity. And now you begin to see uh, that or why 
China's trade surpluses are indicative of strong economic health. Number one, they are actually producing, producing a lot. They do have high savings. They do have very high investments. They do have very high productivity. And when there is a crisis, depression, or bust, they will continue to have the machines, the equipment, the productivity, the labor skill, and everything else remains there for them to produce and make profits. All right? In the United States, we say, well, newspapers, media, and politicians use the well, the word, the American economy has been hollowed out. Hollowed out means that there are no machines, no equipment, and everything else. Is it about time to finish? Let me finish my thoughts, which I have. So, section 1, 11, 1 is global economy. I spoke a little bit, I gave you a little bit of the picture. Section 11, 2 in my textbook is the domestic economy, which is the same as macroeconomy. Uh, now, when we say growth, the textbook, let's relate it, the textbook means and says, it doesn't say growth, it says GDP, gross domestic product. So, when we say it's not producing, we mean GDP. Well, it's a little tricky because GDP includes goods and services, alright? But that's a different topic altogether. So, they look at GDP, we, or I look at growth of GDP. Alright? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You want to look at the level, the other one will look at the rate of growth. Alright, let me try to see what else I have. Unemployment, employment. So, when we say unemployment, we mean unemployment rate as a percentage of the rate, of course. I'm not going to discuss further. Inflation. Now, when they say uh, here, budget deficit, the textbook says budget, budget deficit. Well, it is always much nicer and better analytically not simply to look at the deficit, but to look at its two primary components. Taxes separately and government spending separately. Because when they say the following, here's, here's the way to think why this is not a good way. They say, oh, the government is going to run bigger deficits to stimulate the economy. But if the government increases spending by 200 billion, but raises taxes by 100 billion, it may be that raising taxes will hurt the economy even more than the economy will benefit from the extra spending. So it's always nice to look at these two separately and analyze them separately and if you've been doing your homework assignment properly, been listening to Jim Poplava, he will be talking constantly and focus on the taxes side for a while, and then he'll be talking and focusing on spending. In other words, he's not talking too much about the deficit. He's talking about his primary components, and that's where the focus should be. Not as the textbook incorrectly advises you and teaches you. Just stay focused on the, you know, they try to keep you focused on the wrong thing, all right? You got to stay focused on the two primary components. Of course, to a great extent, we can say the same for trade deficits. Stay focused on imports and exports, but trade deficits are much more indicative of the strong fundamentals of the overall economy. And last but not least, let's add it over here. The textbook has it separate. I will write it separate, but it is not. They call it sentiment. And when we say sentiment, we mean consumer sentiment, and we mean Consumers feel good or they feel bad. So, 
good, strong, positive consumer sentiment results in a lot of consumption, results in booming consumption, and therefore booming businesses. Strong producer sentiment means or results means that producers feel good, manufacturers feel good, they expect good sales, so they invest a lot. So this one is important for the consumption element of GDP, and this one is important for the investment, investment part of GDP. And in this sense, consumer sentiment is very important, very true. I don't consider it a separate part, I consider consumer sentiment number one element of unemployment. So here is how I wrote it. I wrote it consumer confidence. And when I said consumer confidence, I meant the same thing as the textbook says sentiment. So we call it sentiment here. So I consider consumer sentiment to be part of employment, respectively unemployment. So 